Merry Christmas, one and all, and welcome to the Bill Podcast Christmas Special. And what a gift this is. I'm with a very fine actor who brought to life one of the most popular characters in television history. This Sun Hill hero appeared in more episodes than anyone else, and he's achieved a great deal more before and since. Graham Cole, OBE and legend, welcome to the Bill Podcast. I'm in real trouble now, Oliver. How am I going to even live up to that introduction? I don't know anything else. But thank you and a Merry Christmas, one and all. Yeah, quite right. I hope you're fat and you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, this Christmas you're playing Flesh Creep yes. at uh, Wolverhampton, is it? At Wolverhampton Grand, indeed I am. So I will be neither. I will be neither fat, no. nor will I be drunk. We don't get any time to do it. Well, yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, what, paint the scene of your day for us, your Christmas day this year. Will there be any time outside of work for well, you to celebrate? Very poignant of you to say, Christmas Day is the only day we actually have off. Oh, wow. Oh, we'll, okay. we'll work right through the, the whole of the holidays. And it's one of those very strange misnomers of our business that I've tried to get my head around since my 37th panto or something. Oh, wow. um, is that... I love it because it's a kid's introduction to theatre if you get it right. And I always play, well, I've played the baddies for the last 30 years. Yeah. And so if I get that right, they are screaming their heads off every time my foot hits the stage. Which I just love, I love that part. <laughs> but you'll get four or five generations of a family. Maybe it's the only time they're together now all year. And, and the atmosphere is just absolutely electric. But the absolute spin side of that is that I normally go home and ring my family of 300 miles away or, yeah. or whatever it is. So it's a strange dichotomy mm. uh, that, that, that you live, but that's the job. And, and to be honest, it's been a mainstay for me mm. uh, for many, many years. I was one of the few that rose eyebrows with the ITV department of um, contracts. And what is this? There's a clause, I can't do panto. And so a lot of the other actors were saying, why can't we do panto? Well, didn't think ahead, did you? Yeah, <laughs> nice. So it was always locked in, but I had the caveat that I had to be available in the morning <laughs> if they needed me. Right. And there's a story attached to that because uh, Andy and I, I got in, involved in Panto and we did Panto together and it was wonderful and I love working with Andy in particular. And, and we, were, we were on a roll at the time, so we were doing Noel's house party and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. stuff. So we were on an absolute roll. And it was one, but it's hard graft. And he was playing Jack and he's never off. Right. Where he kept just smacking me around the back of the head every time he passed was I was sitting in, we had the dressing room one which you shared. And he used to smack me on the back of the head. And he, when are you on? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it was wonderful to do. But that is strange. But we'll do, I think it's 68 shows or, wow. or something. Uh, wow. We start on the 9th of December. Yeah. I've never opened with a matinee. We're opening with a 2.30 matinee. So normally we have the day to sort of build up to it. So that's going to be quite interesting. And then we'll do two a day right the way through. As I say, Christmas Day we'll have off, but the rest of the time. But being the baddie, I've got a little bit of an allowance so New Year's Eve, I will have a go at them for coming here because I want to be at a party, you know. <laughs> if you didn't book. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll be enjoying myself somewhere now. <laughs> and then, of course, the next day, you know, if you think we're all going to shout and dance and sing and bounce and we were doing what you're doing last night, if you're stupid enough to buy a ticket on New Year's Day, you get the show you deserve. Yeah. Uh, but being a bad, you can get away with it. But it, it is glorious. And I just love playing to kids because they, they will let you know if you're not up to it. Yeah. They will let you know. I've gone in the wings many times and chatted to sort of soap people and that sort of thing. And one or two people maybe aren't sort of sconced in theatre as I. And you meet them in the wings. I can't understand it. The children won't be quiet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Funny they are on when I'm on. <laughs> yeah. Apart, apart from the booing and the throwing of sweets. But apart from that. And it still gives you the same buzz. Oh, I love it. I was talking uh, about, uh, about the script, you know, three weeks before we started to mates and, and I, I was toured with Gareth in Robin Hood uh, earlier this year and that was wonderful he played Robin Hood I played the Sheriff of Nottingham and I loved that role because for once I was actually the bad boss yeah. in the panto I'm Flesh Creep who's subservient to the giant so I try and play him a little bit like a kid yeah. I've been stuck in this place and I don't want to be here anymore than you do you know, but I've been stuck so I, and I, do, I throw tantrums on the stage which the kids enjoy immensely when the giant asks me to do things that I don't want to do and it is a lovely little part but um, again, the baddie bit's the best bit. Yeah, absolutely. Wherever you are, the baddie's the best bit. <laughs> and when you're not working, what does Christmas, this is a Christmas special, what does Christmas mean to you? Uh, I've got a working faith for me, yeah. so it will involve church. I'll, I'll go to church at some point. And uh, I do have a go at them sometimes, because around the country, because you know I tour all the time, 
they're some of the most in, inhospitable places I've ever been into. You know, really? sort of you sit there and Margaret always sits there. Well, Margaret isn't. <laughs> yeah. um, so they're, they're quite strange. So I have a go at them quite a lot um, yeah. for that sort of thing. But I, but I like to go. They're, they're, they're lovely sacred places to just sit and just get your thoughts and it's always quiet. And if you're lucky, uh, if you choose the right ones, I mean, people don't go to St Paul's. You go to St Paul's and the organist is practising. Oh. It's just glorious, you know. Oh. So listen out for that because normally in, in the bigger the cathedrals wherever we go around the country there might be the choir might be in there practicing but certainly nearly always there's an organist or deputy organist that's just been told you're on on Sunday uh, so he's in practicing and it's, it's a lovely lovely place to go and you and I were talking earlier uh, I go to the chapel uh, I live uh, in, in Kent so I go to the chapel at Biggin Hill the RAF chapel and it's beautiful sitting in there just thinking because all the posters and the flags and, and the monuments and the awards that are in there and you just kind of touch the lives a little bit and I think because we live in such a strange world mm. we the actors I mean because we kind of you know I walked through here and got a few nods yeah you're <laughs> quite was, right too someone someone took my picture um, on the on the tube all right and uh, as I walked away I pat him on the shoulder said subtle but you'll never make a spy <laughs> <laughs> and he went into hysterics as a builder, a big, big hunking guy. He went into hysterics, right? but you get so used to it, Oliver. You get so used to people, yeah. and it will be, it will be horrible and heartrending if, when it stops, it will come, I guess, at some point uh, when that happens. But it, it is extraordinary, and that is totally down to why we're here. Yeah, uh, that's down to the building. You know, it's, it's extraordinary link. And it's been quite a year. For the Bill fans, 2017. Mm. Though as we talk, quite a controversial recent bit of news. So the Drama Channel, you were very supportive and, and very much involved in the press to launch the mm. Bill Rewind on the Drama Channel. Fantastic buzz in all the tabloids, people thinking the Bill's coming back in a new Absolutely, yeah, life. yeah. But they've just announced that they're, they're skipping 10 series, mm. and, and I'm guessing you were as surprised as all the fans Yeah, were. I have to say that uh, Mark and Trudy, because they obviously they were the original from Wooden Top, were sort of the two mains, and then Eric, I know, Eric Richard, was hugely influential um, with the drama channel and talking to them and planning it and that yeah. sort of stuff. And then sort of us lesser ones followed in, in their wake behind them, uh, which was lovely. But you're absolutely right, we were... Well, Devastated is not the right word because we, we work with these companies and so yeah. do you. Yes. So you're well yeah. aware that at a whim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I've always said, and this is very naughty over Christmas, we'll give a bloke a suit at a desk and he'll ruin something. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it, it, it's, I, you just don't know. You'd know more than I do about sort of viewing figures, and mm. I, I'm assuming that's what it's about. But Drama Channel. As you look, you know, so when forwards and horses are on, it's sort of off the scale. Yeah. But then as it goes into the other shows, it dribs and drabs. And I, I'm still amazed, because I'm stopped all the time, yeah. where people are saying how much they're enjoying them. And, and again, we're sat in the city of London here. You will see London skyline change in yeah. the 27 years that it was on, because so did we. Mm. Uh, they were literally, I swear not, uh, uh, that we got called sometimes a location manager. And we're off to these locations. Oh, it's great! Look, it's so atmospheric. And when we arrive, they've knocked it down. Oh. <laughs> this whole wall that he had had disappeared. You know, and, and to try and find a cobbled street if you wanted to redo those yeah. feet, yeah, exactly. it's going to be pretty tough. To find it so that it's not well lit or it's not signposted or there's not yellow lines and all that mm. nonsense around it. Because I don't know if any of you know or not, but there's about six of those feet recorded. Oh. Well, you'll know because this is your game. Yeah. But for the titles, however long the titles were, they had them wandering along. Because we all wanted that job. We all were desperate for that job because we would get repeat fees. Oh, right. <laughs> but alas, they didn't. They gave it to Karen England and Paul Page Hanson, right. who were a couple of guys who used to come and do a lot of background stuff with us. And they got it. But then, of course, they just got a one-off payment. Yeah. Okay. But that is the number, wherever you go, it's the number. Are they your feet? Yes, in the dress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's usually my answer. You get the best bit. You're at the very start of uh, all those episodes in the 90s. Yeah, after, after a while. And, and, and I have to say, it's all, I've always been, been such a great relationship with the Met and with policemen around the country, of which I am so honoured and, and really do cherish. But the guys in those early days, you say, who is that driving at? It's too old. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, gives, it shows us in a bad light. Yeah. Like, I can't really say, I don't want to get the poor guy you know, out of a yeah, job. Yeah. But if you look, you know, was it Trudy that was beside him? No, it's supposed to be. I think it's supposed to be. Oh. It, where it's people who don't 
unlook like oh, Aerith right. and Trudy, but it's not them. Oh, I see. Oh, oh was that that was the mask? That didn't, didn't work in No, no. <laughs> not, not in glorious HD television. And the beautiful no, old robot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then, then they up, up them, I think it's series nine or ten. And well, then... I know Trudy and I, we were doing yeah. one, and, and I always call those, that sit beside me when I was doing all those cast stunts, the White Knuckle Brigade, <laughs> right. of which Andy Paul was president. Because <laughs> 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 uh, they'd have to sit while I literally was yeah. doing all the stunts. And we shot that at Bow. All right. Because um, Sun Hill was loosely based on Bow Street, very loosely based. But if you needed a cop shot, that's that's sort of where it was. And if anyone knows that, the road where Bow Police Station is still there, it doesn't have the horses and things anymore. But as you go down toward what would be a Blackwood Tunnel, yeah. there's a little church and then the big flyover literally behind it. And my pulling stop was in front of the church. So as we come over the bow of the hill, and of course we're getting on our head all the time and we stop and the director gets out, well, can you do it a little bit faster? And we want to go as fast as you like, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we did it three or four times. Uh, but each time we're getting faster and faster and each time I had to pull in and handbrake it to stop before we hit the railings of this church. Yeah. And you can see Trudy just going further and further back <laughs> in her seat each time. So it's worth, it's worth a freeze frame. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so lovely this year to see you all reunited. You were on this morning and yeah, you, you had the uh, UK TV did a live Facebook quiz which... <laughs> You Epic. should be doing mastermind about that the bill. Epic. You know your stuff. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, you know, when you love something, and I, do, I choose that phrase very carefully, it's easy to remember and, and to recall. Yeah. And it's in my bones, and I talk about it daily. Uh, my wife will punch me uh, <laughs> if I'm going too deep into things. But uh, wherever you go, you know, the, the thing is the bill touched lives. I know it sounds mm. coy, but it really did. And, and the age that you are, most of the people come and talk to me at your age. Yeah. They watch it as a little kid, and I go and do after dinner speeches. You know, I'll be doing one down in you very soon, down in Southampton soon for PO and things. And some of my opening gambit, depending, I never really plan it too much. My, my opening gambit is your kids went, you used to watch the bill, didn't you? You used to use us so you could stay up for another hour with your parents, didn't you? <laughs> but it's educational, mummy. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that's your link with, with the audience, you know, and. Uh, what have we been off eight eight years? Eight years, no, yeah. I think you know, Ooh, that's, yeah. that's a stunning amount of time for people to still absolutely recognise you with their busy lives and everything that's going on. And uh, mm. I expect policemen to, because they usually will come up and have yeah. a little go, you know, come up behind me and try and frighten me and that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, I get a lot of those guys I meet with commendations and things that I do with the Met and stuff. I'm very fully still involved with, yeah. with the Met. I'm, a, I think, a president or ambassador or something for the um, volunteer police cadets, which is fantastic. So I meet all the youngsters that are are coming through this. It's very special. And I think the reason it works is because we had to go and research it. As you know, in those early days, one car, one camera, one boom op, one lighting director, no rehearsals, go do it. Yeah. Uh, We had a read through originally in the first hour long days. But people forget, man, you made eight, was it, I think? Eight to 10. Yeah, 12 episodes in those, yeah, Yeah, series, Yeah. yeah. And then it moved, you know, Snowball, yeah. split into all sorts of weird ones. But when you go and you, you got the scripts and stuff, and they came to me and uh, Peter Grigine, bless him, uh, said to me, you know, that we want him to be a real experience, you know, the most experienced cop. It doesn't matter whether it's CID, DIs, whoever it is, he's been there, he's done it, he's seen it. And we want him to be able to sit back and go, yeah, well, when I was, you know, and all that yeah. sort of stuff. <laughs> and the only way you can play that, Oliver, is go and talk to the guys who do it. Yeah. What was lovely is our script and our production team would talk to sort of senior officers and get all that sort of side of it. But my job, I always thought, was, okay, this stop and search, what does that mean? What do, how does the guy interpret that that's got to make it work on the streets? And as you know, every new parliament, they change yeah. the parameters of it or whether it should or whether it shouldn't. And that was great. And then what I decided to do, foolishly or not, was to play for policemen. So I would be out with the guys, as you know, I used to sit in the back of the area car three, four times a year and just go on shift with them. Or if I was at Hendon, I I did the driving course there about eight times. So I could drive Sierra One on the streets of London. We didn't have to shut the streets off because I'd done the course with the boys. I think they they appreciated that. But more and more I used to pick up little bits and so I would throw in these odd lines that only policemen would would understand. Yeah. So it was um, really cool. I I mean, they give me the hand, you know, driving down the street behind it. IRA guy, I think he's coming on soon the episode, and uh, and he says, pull back Tony and the guy's got guns, and, yeah we used to have but they took ours away and there's, there's stuff like that yeah. that you just, you know yeah, okay, yeah, just do it just, just for the guys 
I did a bit of filming with uh, ITV. This is well, four or five years ago now. We filmed a day in the life of the police with Birmingham mm. police, and I, I I did the overnight shift. And so I, I've filmed in the back seat uh, like a 110 mile an hour car yeah. chase, and it is extraordinary because you're going so fast yet. I felt safe. Totally, yeah. Because these guys know what they're doing. Yeah. And they're so brave. I had a press guy with me. He had a stab vest on. He said, oh, we haven't got one for you. That's and I was, I was like, oh, okay. you're the producer. Man. <laughs> yeah. You get another producer. <laughs> <laughs> but they are um, incredible what they do. I mean, your, yeah. your respect for them obviously just grew and grew and grew. For well, I time. raced cars, when, I raced carts when I was like 14, go-karts. Yeah. And then it progressed into sort of trying to race if one could. What the bill gave me, of course, was this huge sudden profile. And when Andy and I used to do Noel's house party, and Noel found out I had a racing license, and he used to do all these, and still does, all these sorts of deals with all sorts of people oh, yeah. and cars and stuff. And he'd ring me up and say, yeah, what's your schedule, man? It's really heavy, Noel. Well, what are you doing on Sunday? I don't know. Well, there's a race at Castle Coombe. Would you be able to get there maybe Saturday, do the little chat to the... Because Sunday, if, if they're actually racing in those days, uh, they'd give you a car, but you wouldn't accumulate any points for the team. So in a way, that it's not to their advantage. But on, on the test day, and, and if anyone wants, ever wants to go, go to touring cars, because you can get in there, you can wander around the pits, you can talk to the drivers, talk to the technicians. You know, It's a lovely thing, and I, and I love the fact that, oh, yeah, I've, I've got one of these, oh, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I bet it's got the same engine, isn't it? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you haven't got the three boys that have been boring everything out that they could possibly bore <laughs> to make it go just a little bit faster. But, that, but I had wonderful experiences, and, and Noel would sort of say, oh, well, so I always lived in South London. Uh, Noel would say, oh, I'll be at Biggin Hill, and a helicopter would land and take me up to Castle Coombe or wow. Silverstone or wherever. But as I grew older, you have to keep taking the driving test. And when you pass 40, they think you're going to die. Right. I'm not going to even talk about it when I pass 50. <laughs> um, and you have to keep going up to Silverstone and, and doing the tests. So they feel, you know, that you're right. But it was a wonderful thing to do. I'm also an advanced motorist with the uh, Institute of Advanced Motorists. Love cars. I've always loved cars yeah. and, and driving anything that I, could, that I could drive. And again, the bill opened up all those doors as I went off and did this wonderful training uh, with the police. And they take you, as the boys will know, if there's policemen listening to this, when they're around Chiswick and around those roundabouts. And you do it with a marked car. But then the hardest stuff is you do it with an unmarked car because you, you'll be part of the, a surveillance team, but you've got to keep up with the, the bandits. Yeah. And that is some training. I mean, the guys that are beside you are amazing. And the confidence they give you and, and, the, and the, that power that you're able to enact on the streets is extraordinary. They do this 40-minute commentary. So from when he says, I'm now observing from now, and there'll be another guy behind you, and they've both got clipboards, and they're flicking papers and pencils, oh, right. and pens are scratching on the thing, and you think, I'm failing miserably <laughs> here. But from the minute it starts, you have to observe everything you see on the road and vocalise it. So right. there's a woman I can see in the pram on the left-hand side, or on the right-hand side, I can see there's a parked vehicle, maybe the door's going to open, I can see a cycle, and oh, there's a bus stop further up, maybe there's someone who's going to step out of the road to wait for that. You have to just observe everything when you can. But it highlights your attention to details. The guys are saying, when you're doing those high speeds, as you know, you've been out there. Yeah. If the guy in front does something to you, you might be able to go around, and the chances are you're going to hit him. Yeah. Be the car in front of him, or indeed the car ahead of that, if he decides he's going to turn right, decision you're going to overtake. It's a massive, massive task and wonderful training. And one of the things I know the Met and, and the police service around the country are having trouble with keeping those courses because they're you know, really? it's necessary. Well, of course it is. Yeah. Because you're only as good as your training. And you need to be pushed like we are you know, at Silverstone. To race those cars, we have an, an instructor beside us and he will say whether he thinks you're, you're good. And part of that driving is uh, manual, that you cannot do anything until he tells you you can do it. So you're coming up to a corner at like 90 miles an hour and say, please let me break, please oh. let me break. But, he, but he's pushing you and pushing you and pushing you, wow. uh, testing your heart and all that sort of stuff, you know, and your reactions and all that. But, yeah. uh, but it's the same, same with the police. And what is fascinating, and I used to say many times when we used to film on the streets, was I'd get out of the car and then all the kids would come around and say, can you sign my autograph? I say, hold on, mate, I will in a minute, but at the moment I can't hold a pen. No, it's, it's the there. adrenaline yeah. is just pumping through you. Because remember, we're, we're trying to remember dialogue and all that sort of thing. I mean, there are many, I don't know if you've ever got any, there are many, many outtakes. Two reasons. 
One where I'm driving along, I've got this 46 grand camera strapped to the side of the car, and white van man is heading towards me. Uh-oh. And a very naughty word comes out, and all you hear behind is, cut! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and of course, the, uh, the other big thing is if you don't want to be the one to blow your lines. No. You know, and we'll start off way away and then go right through the traffic and whatever happens in between it happens and it is pretty scary. And at the end of it, uh, Jeff was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Hollis. So that he was stunning. But I could do anything in that car and he never batted an eyelid. Same I think with Paul. Yeah. I think he trusted Paul in, in the same way. And you have to, you know, but if you're delivering dialogue and things, it's so very, yeah. very different. But in London, you know, I'm a boy, I'm still a boy. I'm, I'm, I'm eight and a half in my head. <laughs> And one of the great things that the directors would come up to you and say, that's very good, but do you think you could do it a bit quicker? Mm, yeah, I suppose. But you need that training. Uh, the second thing I was going to say that, that a lot of the first assistants would know is that I would want to drive quite slowly the course. Yeah. And it wasn't when we were doing the big stunt with Sierra One, because very often that's going to be an automatic and the camera would be outside. But it's when they then bring in an estate version and we'll do all the dialogue inside and they'll cover all the ah. various angles. But then you've now got all the gear in the back of the car. And you've got maybe a sound engineer, certainly the lighting and the director, plus the, the actors. So you've got a lot more weight in the car. Yeah. And uh, then if you're the driver, you then got to be aware that if we're in a built-up area, you can't be reflected in any shop windows because the audience will then see it's a mistake version and not Sierra One and they'll never be able to cut it together. But I love the technical side of that, working with the... Uh, with the camera crews, you know, they want to go from the windscreen to the side of the window, or from the side of the window on a chase through the windscreen. And I, it was just stunning. And Ross Oglethorpe, once I remember him, we were filming in um, near Penge somewhere. And wherever we were sort of blowing up cars, we went to Penge. I assume no one took a blind bit of notice. <laughs> no, no, the car's on fire. But we were doing this fast sequence there, and we were over a bridge. It's quite a newly built uh, road. And we're going through, and we keep doing it. Because, you know, we only ever had one handheld camera on the build, you know. Yeah. So we're going through, and I said, What's the problem? And he said, well, Ross Cameron's got a problem, is that it's an eight foot wide walkway. And as he's going down with the camera, it's throwing out focus. And when we can't pick you up on the other side, said, well, what's the answer? Can you go faster? And he'll whip pan it. <laughs> um, okay. I think, I don't know if it was tip Tippy, I can't remember which of the really good stuntmen was in the bandit, bandit car ahead of us. But, um, he went through it. I went under that bridge at 90. Wow. Wow. <laughs> in Sierra one. And we had, I don't know, a car, a car and a half distance between Cold me blimey. and the bandit car. And when we went back to the rushes and, and we looked at the rushes, all you could hear is we'd gone under the bridge and all you could hear because <laughs> <laughs> we had a main road. <laughs> Literally about 100 metres the other side of the bridge. Oh. Uh, it, was, it was extraordinary. But it's that stuff. Yeah. Where, where else would you? And what other program? No, we you know, we pioneered yeah. all that stuff. That's why I was so happy to be a part of history of doing things that no one's ever done before. Health and safety, I mean, they would have a fit. Yeah, yeah. But the, like we were saying, location management, don't tell them. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned like you still feel like an eight and a half year old. Is that the sort of age you were when you first got the acting bug? Take us back. That's, uh, that's very astute of you. Your, <laughs> your psychology course has <laughs> served you well. Tell your mum and dad that you spent the money wisely. <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. I used to get Saturday morning cinema. Oh, nice. And uh, th- there's audiences now, like when I go and talk to drama students and stuff, they just look at you blankly. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> what is that? But at, at 8, 9, 10, you could go Saturday morning, get a drink, get a packet of popcorn, watch... B movies, which I loved, which is like the Jack Hawkins, the old war movies in which we serve and stuff like that. And then what would be the, the A, John Wayne, Humphrey Bogart, those. And carefully chosen uh, for the sort of boys. And Flash, I, never, I was never really into Flash Gordon and that stuff, but right. I know a lot of the lads were. I much preferred the, the war movies or the cowboys and that sort of stuff. And, uh, and you know my character quite well. I always felt that I should reward those that watch the bill. And every now and again, if I thought Stamp had done a good job, I'd do the John Wayne slow walk back to Sierra One. <laughs> yeah. That's where that came from, and I, I wanted to do that. Alas, if I have one sadness in my career, it's not doing more movies. Mm. Uh, I, I love doing them. I've worked with some great uh, film actors, and and I'd love I'd love to have done. But it's this country for some unknown reason, as you will know in all the in, the interviews you do. If you do theatre, you simply can, can't break out of that and get into television or film. Or yeah. if you do TV, they won't let you into movies. It's a it's a straight. But I think it's more about the management structure than it is about the artists. 
because I think they feel they can sell you, but they can only sell you about it. But where in actual fact, as you know, I did rep for many, many years. Yeah. And your audiences will come in, you know, and you grow a full beard and you shave bits of it off and put a stone in your shoes so you walk with a limp. I mean, there's all sorts of things you would do. <laughs> and the audiences appreciated that fact. I mean, other than the greatest gift we've got, which is, of course, our vocal cords, where we can put in accents and all that sort of stuff with it. But your audiences would run with that and would see you do that. And I think it's really sad that TV execs don't say, we are actors, give us the characters. Yeah, yeah. And we'll go and we'll play them. And there's, uh, when you've been in the bill as long as I have, you know, there's this big stigma about being stamp and stuff. But I defy anyone, you don't go and watch anything, you don't watch an old house party or any of that stuff. You know, there was a little bit, I was playing a copper as well. Yeah. There. But there wasn't a bit of stamp in that. You know, you play whoever it is, they give uh, you to play. And I think it's rather sad that, particularly if you hone your craft, as most of us do in theatre, so you're playing myriad parts mm. from Chekhov. I mean, the, the, for instance, my very first job down at the Coventry Belgrade, we were doing Calamity Jam, we were doing upstairs, and during the day, we were doing The Seagull. No for way. Schools. Wow. So, I had like, <laughs> yeah. like a diverse change in that. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> what you're wearing now, I don't know, but I hope it fits the words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was an extraordinary time. Uh, there was a girl, Linda Michelle. Uh, was playing Calamity, wonderful, wonderful actress, who is now one of our greatest crime novel writers. Oh, Jane Linda, Dennison and Linda Laplante. That's wow. who she became, and I meet her every now and again at charity functions. Go, you still haven't written me a role, bitch. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, three of your more recent TV and film roles, by coincidence, have seen you reunited with some of your former of a bill colleagues. I mean, you did a marvellous Doctor just a couple of years oh, ago. Oh, that was stunning. A lovely role, a headmaster. Lovely writing. Yeah, lovely, really, lovely writing. he's stuck in the past, isn't he, that character? Yeah. He's having a, a real rough didn't time move. of it. Yeah, yeah. didn't move. Yeah, made him Robert Hudson. Yeah, and, and Chris, Chris Walker. Yeah. So, that, is that a coincidence? Free the bill? Well, it was bill um, Ian White directed it. Ah. It was he who rang me up and asked me would I like to play it, and they sent me a script and yeah. yeah, fantastic. I didn't really know. Well, I knew Chris, obviously, because he's he directs there as well, as I'm sure you, you probably yeah. know. Uh, but I didn't know about Robert until I got there. No and then way. we were like, we've got three days together, and we're filming away. And we're still in the car park, and you sort of say to them, because it's BBC, you know, are there any publicity people kind of on this? And, no way. <laughs> and that's what I don't understand about my business. No. Because it's about your audiences. Absolutely. And the audiences would love to know that, and maybe that might bring them few hundred extra in to see yeah. how do we do it you know and how do you change and all that so, and, and it, but it was extraordinary we just took pictures and put it on Facebook right thank you Facebook yeah exactly uh, I'm on the road so I, I, it, it defies sometimes my business I'm thinking yeah. of we're in communications mm, this is it well because <laughs> it's extraordinary I mean I'm not in casting but I can assure you if I were I would be just lapping up opportunities to be casting my heroes yeah. but you've got the audience watching Doctors are probably a healthy amount of the 18 million who are watching for the sure. bill. Yeah, for know? sure. And seeing yeah. you, it's a treat, it's a reward for the audience when you're sure. on screen. Because mm. people love watching you, you're a very likeable man and you always play. Your likability as a person comes over in your part. Even though he's horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because it's, it's, it's always one of the interesting things, you know, when I go in Panto and, and I do work hard at being a villain, yeah. is that it's got to be bad, otherwise the rest of the cast have got no one to play to. Mm. And the kids, my first view, this entrance can be a little bit difficult for, for me because it's written slightly different, but normally my view would be, if, certainly if I'm Abenazo, yeah. if two or three kids are not taking out my first entrance, I've done it wrong. Right. right. <laughs> and, and from then on, and with Gareth when we did uh, uh, Robin Hood, that was just stunning, playing the show in Nottingham. Yeah. And the kids, the cacophony of noise as I walked out was just fantastic, absolutely yeah. fantastic. And that's what it's about. And you're right, you know, you have to work. It, it is the same audiences. I know yeah. people, we always used to get this thing, well, what are you, are you so, I don't care. No. 18 million people are watching us, who cares what they call us? Absolutely. It makes no difference what they call us. I don't care, I'll be in any, I'll go to the soap awards, I'll go to the drama yeah. awards, I'll do the NTAs, anywhere you like, you know, I don't care. I think that was one of the Bill's problems, strangely enough, is we, I think we, whether you went to the Yacht Club, mm with the Hooray Henrys or whether you walk down the street in Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer's or Waitrose and there are other stores available <laughs> um, people come up to you you know and that was the, the great gift of that show and every now and again sort of exactly I went to Australia many times eight times on the back of the bill uh, right. doing these PAs and things and we could sell them easily but I'd go to the team and go you know can I have like 
30 t-shirts, 14 hats, and I'm going to throw out badges, you know, we just have different colour badges and stuff. And a box would arrive in the dressing room with the invoice, and I'd have to pay cost for it. And you have to think, there's something wrong here, boy. (laughs) Well, because I was going to say, because, I mean, you must have been the publicity team's dream. You know, you're making all these personal appearances. I mean, I, I'm of the age of Sooty and Co. Absolutely. You know, so Bring him on. You're popping up as Del Morris. Grado or whatever it was. Yeah, Del Burg- Grub, Burg- was. Burglary back was Yeah, awesome Del thing. Grub. It was, yeah. <laughs> and, like, that's yeah. promoting their show, isn't it? You know, by you going on and, and having Well, between you and I and the rest of listening to this podcast, yeah. when we got an old house party, we all went on to sing originally. Uh, there was about eight of us in the cast. And then after that... Charlie Adams, who used to write it, and bear in mind, I come from a variety background. That's when I started as a, as a singer. Yeah. And so, so and they got a phone call from Noel. He said, you know, we've got a couple of you. Come on, we've got this idea. Charlie's written this idea. And again, I coerced Andy, bless him. And, um, and we went in little, I think, did we do 48 live house parties or something over wow. three years or something? And Charlie used to write this stuff. And every Wednesday, I had to go knocking on any exec, whoever it might have been, door pleading with them to let this go and what you just said is yeah. exactly right I think oh, no, this is an ITV show we're not Andy and Graham we're the boys from the bill mm. that's how we were built we didn't have names on the show there's no complications like that at all and we I think at the time with Noel's house was something like 22 million yeah I mean, something ridiculous Andy and I it never left us well, we used to go in loosely rehearsed, but it wasn't. So I mean, it was for cameras more than anything else. So I never knew anything long, anything was going to last. But the buzz in the studio was fantastic. And he was a master, Noel Edmonds, at, at that kind of TV. Yeah. And that pioneering, you know, in someone's front room. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I know. I mean I just keeping it yeah. quiet, just yeah. secret, and getting all the equipment in. So absolutely massive manoeuvres were involved. And then live satellite links and things. It mm. was incredibly part of it. But uh, Andy, big Arsenal supporter, drove me mad in Sierra One talking about, you lost! Yeah. <laughs> He'd go on and on and on about it. Uh, he used to go to the World of Sport studio and go with the, with the boys and watch all the matches live. And, oh, and I'd wander off to see what was going on. Doctor Who would be in there or something else would be yeah. going on. It's a wonderful thing about BBC and why I desperately wanted to save it. Yeah. 22 when I first walked into that building. Oh. You sat in dressing rooms there and think, who sat here before you? And you can't recreate that in Salford or anywhere else. That was such a magical place. And live, biggest um, recording studios, almost, certainly in, in London, nothing to get anywhere close to it. You've got to go to Shepparton or something, yeah, something yeah. like that to build those, and they've got to build it. A 480 odd seater uh, wow. live theatre we used to do, uh, not live TV from there, and that was House Party. Uh, but yeah, I had to go in there and sort of, oh, please, let, please let's go and do it. It's yeah. a two, two minute, and the thing that Andy and I, because they asked us to do other stuff, and then we just we just do that. And what I loved about Charlie Adams, he came up off about the second or third show. And we always learned it, Andy and I. It was on auto cue, but we always learned it. So I, had, I loved props. So yes. we had loads of props and things. And Charlie came up to me about the second or third show and he said, I've got this idea, and if it works, okay. And so Andy comes out, and I'm just beside him. I mean, I'm the inane one, he's the, he's the brains department. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, uh, We had a steak out at Heathrow Airport. I'm like, going, I had chips with mine. <laughs> and from then on, that became a running theme. And yeah. seriously, as I used to go around, people would shout it out. And the reason it's in my head is only 18 months ago, we were at Wisley at the garden, uh, you know, National Garden Centre, we were wandering around there, I love my garden. I cherish the brains in that, my missus, but we were there looking at the plants. And they got this sort of little train that you can go on with the old people. Oh, lovely. And as it went, the little guy's got a little thing, and as the bloke actually went past me, he just shouted, I'll have chips with mine. No way, isn't that magic? Well, how long is that? 22 years, maybe? Must be. Yeah. Must be. And you think, that's what good television does. Yeah. That stays in their mind and they knew it was live and some of the execs would come and, uh, and Noel would ask me to go and talk to them and they want to dissect it and analyse it mm. and so there are just some things when it's live just take the ball and run with it for as long as you can keep hold of it mm. don't question it just say thank you yeah. and go with it but they wanted to structure it I mean Andy and I we used to seriously Oliver, we used to stand on a little 10 by 8 plinth in semi-darkness listening to the audience tiniest little monitor that right. didn't want any light to running over behind us. Tiny sort of monitor what they're doing. They never really knew how anything was last long was going to last because it was live. And then suddenly the lights would hit you, the doorbell goes and it opens live to 22 million people. Yeah. What a and buzz. that's the job. Yeah. And that is just... And sometimes we'd stand there for 20, 30 seconds we couldn't utter a word. Yeah. They were just screaming. <laughs> it was extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. 
Now you talk about things sticking in my memory. I mean, we're we're diving all over the place yeah. here, but it's good fun. Have you read my book? <laughs> yeah. Is <laughs> <laughs> an episode of a bill. Uh, now I, I only watched this again for the first time since it was transmitted yesterday, but I remember it. I mean, it's on DVD. I, I've got. So it's not on. It's not on the drama. No, okay. although it will be soon. So it, I was watching Dashwood. On drama uh, quite right, yeah. We're enjoying <laughs> Dashwood. Yeah. But yeah, taking sides. So it's after Simon Atwell's been run over and uh, Stamp goes to his funeral. Yeah. Now, I haven't watched this since the original transmission, but I remembered distinctly the way you said that you'd come to pay your respects. It was lodged in my memory 19 years later. Uh, and watching it again, it still moved me. And well done. It's a knockout performance. You Special. play. You Thank play. You. To me, you're at your best when Stamps broken. Mm. When everyone's favourite copper and hero is worlds turned upside down. You play that so well because you're believable. You're not going over the top. Here is a man whose worlds come crashing down, and he's mm. helpless. You know. And it's such a moving moment. You know. You come to pay your respects. It gets slapped in your face. You throw the flowers in the bin. But I remembered that. Wow. From transmission, originally. Thank you. Do you know what you just say? And, and it doesn't, I don't mean this at all lightly, that's why we do it. Yeah. That's why you act for a living, particularly it's why you do theatre. Yeah. Is people will see you years and years and years later and go, oh, I was in the night. Yeah. The reason that I particularly am humbled by those words is that everything in TV, and you work a lot in, in film, is almost against you mm. for that kind of work because of the time schedules, because of what's going on around about you. Melvin's funeral, yeah, uh, yeah, right. a while ago, yeah. when I give that eulogy, That's right. we did all day with all the faces in the room, everyone filled with the church, and I was waiting and waiting and waiting, saying, okay, now we're going to do your bit. And they said, okay, we'll break it for lunch. And then they cleared everybody. And when I did that speech, I had no one no way. to play to. Oh. No one at all. And it's then when you pull on all of your resources of remembering yeah. where you were and what family or friends you'd lost to recreate that and because we're only one held held camera we also have often you know they put it on track and stuff yes and when they do that there's very little actors can do to help the cameraman mm. he's fixed whereas normally we can just move just a little bit we can see they're in a little bit of trouble so you can move and that sort of stuff but when it's emotional most of us move with emotions. Yeah. Nearly everybody does. And it was extraordinary. On the eye lines, I had to remember where everybody was sitting because I knew when they cut it, they would be cutting away yeah, to too. various people. I, the reason I say that is because the, that's the techniques, that's what we're paid yeah. to do. But it makes it so much harder. Well, yeah, quite right. So I mean, much harder. I'm amazed by that. I mean, because that episode is a real changing of the guard, isn't it? Because I mean, Mark Powley's left yeah. us, Colin Blumenau and Robert mm. Hudson come back as their little yeah. guest bit. Yeah. But that's the real time, isn't it? Mm. When Move base. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Um, Andrew Paul, Hugh Higginson, Tony O'Callaghan, mm. you, you, you all become centre stage like, for the next decade. Yeah. And that mm. must have been... And, oh, and of course, you never know. People always assume that I knew I was going to be there for 25 years. My <laughs> contract was six monthly. Right. It always was from day one. Yeah. And as indeed all the other actors. So if you're naughty, they can elbow you, or if the writers. I mean, I've, I've always found a bit of a. I'm gonna, people in my industry will hate me for this, to, to mention this. But then again, you know, we, we can't take your character any further. You know, you know, that really is a slight on your, yeah. <laughs> your writers' Absolutely. Yeah. writing capabilities. But that's what they always say to you as a sort of a, a get out yeah. sort of clause, I, I suppose. But we're only as good as the words. And when you pick mm. up those scripts, and certainly when you've been there for a while, there's something very magical when you realise this writer he knows yeah. where you're coming from. Well, how about that for a Christmas Day surprise? Graham's such an interesting man that this is part one of a three-part special with one of the Bill's most iconic stars, and we'll be back in January with more stamp memories. In the meantime, Merry Christmas. Here's to a happy and healthy 2018.